Hi guys, I'm Darren and in this video we're going to be checking out the latest releases from iNav, that's iNav 7 and iNav 7.1. So it's been a little while from my last video, I did post a video a while back saying that I will be away for a bit because of um, quite a few things going on. I just wanted to get this video out with the new versions of iNav and we'll take a look at what's going on. So I'm going to go over the changes for both iNav 7.0 and iNav 7.1. I did do a pre-release uh, change thing for 7.0, so we'll probably cover a bit of ground again. But first of all, let's find out how to download this stuff. So to download the latest version, we go to the iNav GitHub, and I'll put a link in the video description. And what we're going to do is look over in this section here for releases, and you can see the latest is 7.1. So I'm going to click on 7.1, and it will take me to the latest release. And to download it, we just go down to Assets and you choose the version you want, whether it's Linux, Mac OS or Windows, download it and install it. I'm not going to cover that in this video. There's plenty of iNav setup installation videos, so check one of those out. I've got one for iNav 5. It's old, but a lot of the stuff is the same. I probably will do an updated version for this new version of iNav. If you're running an older version of iNav, updating isn't really that difficult. If you're on iNav version 6 or 6.1 or even 7.0, then updating is going to be pretty quick and easy. If you're on an older version than that, you could actually go back through the update process, but I'd recommend really just starting from scratch. You can pull certain parts like your OSD layout and stuff out of a diff file, but I would recommend really starting again because there have been some significant changes. But what I'm going to do is very quickly go through an update process because it is so quick. So I'm just going to connect. I'm going to go straight into CLI. You notice we've got some autocomplete stuff now. So while I'm here, I'll show you this. So if we type set, uh, we can start typing. So when it knows roughly what we want to look for, it will give some suggestions here and we can just click the one we want so that would give us the board roll for example but anyway I don't want that so let's clear this I'm going to do diff all and I'm just going to do a very quick lazy version I'm going to copy it to the clipboard you can save this off to a file if you want then I'm going to disconnect we'll go to firmware flasher and it will automatically select the board for you if it's after, I can't remember what version now, on a 5 or newer, it should automatically find the board. We're going to choose the latest stable release, which is INAV 7.1.0 at this time. We're going to do full chip arrays. We're going to download the firmware from the internet. And then we're going to flash the firmware. Now on the screen, you would have seen the release notes. Don't worry, I'm going to show you where to find those because it is very, very important to read the release notes so you know what's changed. Um, there's also going to be instructions on there for major changes, stuff that you may, may need to take note of. So I'll go over that on GitHub once we've finished this, but I'll be back once this is flashed. Right, so there we go. It's just verified programming is successful. Now I'm going to connect to the flight controller. Now, because we have our diff, I'm just going to choose keep current settings. There's no need to choose defaults because um, I'll show you in a sec. Let's go to CLI and what I'm going to do is paste everything in. Actually, let's clear the screen first. Got everything pasted. I'm just going to delete the save and I'll show you why we can keep current settings. So this is my whole default apart from the save. So when it goes through this, if it finds any errors, they'll pop up in red and let you know. But there shouldn't be any errors as far as I can remember. Right, so no, there, no, there were no errors in my diff. So let's go back to the very top. And the reason we can say ignore um, all the defaults on that dialog box is because it does this at the very top of a diff all. And basically that resets everything back to default values anyway. So anything we choose on those presets will just get wiped when we put our diff in. So let me just save these settings. And that is the update complete. So now let's have a look at what's changed and I can use this as an example if we need to. So we've just gone back to the page that we downloaded Configurator from. And the reason for this is that's where you can find the release notes. So what I'm going to do is first go to INAV 7.0. I don't know why it hasn't got 0.0, but this is 
and we can just have a quick look through here and check out the release notes. So if there was anything important that could affect your setup, they will get separate sections. So we can see in this version of Configurator, it's all just um, minor changes or changes where it doesn't really need explaining too much but we'll go into that in a bit more detail in a sec. So they're the changes for 7.0. These are the changes for 7.1. The same is true with the firmware. You'll see I'm now in the firmware section of GitHub and I'll put that link in the description as well. And if you go to releases and the version number, you will also find the release notes for those. They're also in the wiki. Um, so if I open the wiki up, you can see we have release notes going back to 1.73 in the, in the wiki, but they're all in here if you want to check them out. But let's check out the INAV 7.0 firmware release notes because a lot of the work happens on the firmware side and that impacts other areas. So any big changes, you'll see descriptions in here. So if we scroll down, we can see the update process. I've just shown you quickly how to do that so we can ignore that. If you are coming from an older version, there is that page that will show you how to update in steps, but I'd recommend just doing it from scratch. So the major change section is what I was alluding to earlier, where it will show you big changes. Now, this one maybe should have been on Configurator because it's more a Configurator thing visually, but in the background, there's quite a bit going on. So the first thing in the major changes section is this new flexible motor and servo output allocation. Now, this has come because People came over from beta flight and were missing resource reallocation. And it's something that you can't do in INAV. The reason being, beta flight doesn't really know or care about servos, whereas INAV can use motors and servos. And the reason this matters is because they operate at different speeds. On the MCU on the flight controller, so for example, an F405 MCU, you have different outputs and you'll have them grouped in timers. The timer has to run at a certain speed. You can choose the speed, but it can't, you can't mix and match the speed on an, an individual timer. So you have to group things like motors and servos onto timers. You can't just um, assign them willy-nilly. So because there's a little bit of discrepancy with, with this image, I'm actually gonna pop configurator up and we'll have a look in here. So you can see this is a flying wing that's been set up. And we have down here the new part, which is our timer outputs. And again, you don't really need to know the technical side, but you just need to know that you can't have motors and servos on the same timer. They have to be different. By default, they will all be set to auto. So this will basically be the flight controller default. So if you bought a flight controller and the manual says, I don't know, an example, S1 and S2 are motors, the rest are servos. That will be how it will be set up, but you can change them. One of the things that you could do is, for example, if you decided you actually wanted a few more servos, this aircraft only has one motor. We can change timer one, which is on S9, to a motor and change everything else to servos. And if I do a save and reboot, you'll see that all this gets shifted. Let me delete the second motor. Let's do a quick save and reboot and we'll be back in a sec. So I've not changed anything else. All I've done is change the timers. You can see now timer one is motors, which has put our motor on S9. Everything else is servos. So if we kept on adding servos, we can have eight servos on this flight controller. Likewise, if this was a quadcopter, I could have timer four as motors, timer three as motors, and set the others to servos. Then these four here will be motor outputs. These will be uh, servo outputs. If I had a hexcopter, I could set timer eight to motors and then these would also be motors. This makes this a lot more flexible. It's probably better if you don't need to change it because for example, if you're using a, a quadcopter and you have a, a stack, the cable that goes between the flight controller and the um, all-in-one ESC will already be, be defined but with certain timers. But if you're happy to resolder stuff and move stuff about, then this will give you a lot more flexibility. And again, the mixer stuff is basically the same. So that's that covered. The next thing that we have is mixer profiles and VTOL support. Now, VTOL support was the big thing that came in 7.0. 
and it's such a big thing i'm not really going to cover it in this video but there are documents here that you can check out for setting up the vtol i've not actually done this myself yet i do plan on getting a vtol i'm actually waiting for foam to come back in stock i have my hearing t1 vtol kit here i'm just waiting for foam to come back in to hobby rc so i can actually buy the foam but um, yeah, I'll cover VTOL once I've got it set up and working in a separate video. But if you want to know how to get it working, you can do so by looking at those documents. And while we're on the subject, in 7.1, tail sitter support was added. So as far as I know, it's got tilt rotors, quad plane, and now tail sitter as well. They could all be done in INAV. So yeah, glanced over that, but it's quite a big subject i don't really want to cover it in this video in too much depth next one is easy tune which is a way for you to tune your quad easier again i've not actually touched this myself because i've not got a quad on inav yet bad me but um, the whole point of this is you can just slide the stuff around to get your quad flying better so if you set up and use easy tune it doesn't actually use the traditional pid tuning stuff if I get configurator back up, it'll go in PID tuning. This, this is set to aeroplane. But basically, you won't even get this tab if you, if you use easy tune. And easy tune won't set up, um, appear here unless you're using a multi rotor. And you turn on easy tune by clicking enable. So again, I've not really tried this, so I, I don't really want to explain how to use it because I don't know myself yet. But basically, you're going to be sliding these up and down to tweak the performance of your quad and how it feels and once you've got it happy at this level you can turn this back off and then you'll get your pid tuning tab back and then you could do fine adjustments in there if you wanted or even just make notes of the settings so that's a brief overview of easy tune now the next one is something that wasn't in the original release notes but got added afterwards and it's something that is very, very important. And that is the ability to rearm in flight. There's quite a big uh, topic on it in which you can read about here. But basically, if you are flying, accidentally disarm, you have five seconds in which you can rearm instantly without having to do anything else. If you rem if you're used to the older versions of iNav, you would have to make sure you're in a non-navigation mode, the throttle was at zero, that you weren't moving pitch and roll, that sort of thing, before you could rearm in flight. I've done a video on it, it's not actually that difficult to do. I have rearmed a quad in flight before, it's, it's not something that's really that difficult, but people did worry about it. So much so that they would make it harder for them to disarm. So they would put, I don't know, mechanical switches on where they had to pull a tab up to actually disarm or put it on a, uh, a knob or have multiple switches or you had to do two switches to disarm, that sort of thing, which I was never really a fan of. It, it may sound harsh, but disarming isn't there for your aircraft. It's for the safety of others. If you need to disarm an emergency because someone's hand is getting sliced up, you just want to flick that switch and it instantly kill power. And the reason why traditionally a lot of people have used the one of the two top shoulder switches on a transmitter is that's because that's what everybody used. If you're at a flying club and someone's model's gone haywire, you know if you flick one of those two switches, it will kill the motor. And that's the reason why it's there. People worry about disarming in flight and losing their investment, that sort of thing, which to me personally was always a secondary thing. Safety always has to come first. The other thing that sort of was a little bit annoying was, especially with fixed wing, a fixed wing can glide. Um, so having all this extra stuff that, uh, that sort of effectively makes it harder to do a, a safety thing didn't really sit right with me, which is why I, sh I had a video on how to basically do this functionality on your own using the programming framework. But now this is all done for you. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to set anything up. It's already working. If it thinks you're flying and you disarm, just rearm and it will all come back and you can continue on your way. In future, you really do not need to make it harder to disarm. It's not an issue anymore. If you disarm, just rearm and carry on flying. With multi-rotor, it was a bit more tricky. If you're flying a multi-rotor and you accidentally disarm, 
do you have air mode still can you you know write the quad so control was an issue but also if you're doing an av mode and stuff it, it might be a bit trickier to get it out and rearm with this system it's really nice if you disarm it will actually put it into angle so it will self write then you rearm and you can carry on so you should already be in the right orientation if you want to read more on it it's here um, it's a very useful feature but just yeah don't worry about disarming in flight anymore it's a thing well it's not a thing of the past you could still do it i've still done it myself even purposely last week but to actually rearm is no longer an issue the next thing is timer dma burst which is a bit more of a technical thing so as as to what goes on you don't really need to worry about it but what it does mean is that the matek f405 te and the speedy b f405 v3 stack d shot now works on all the motor outputs so you don't need to worry about that anymore. It's something that has been fixed. Jetty X bus protocol has been fixed. There was an issue where it used to hang during operation, but that has been fixed now. So you don't need to worry about that. While on the subject of Jetty, you also can use 24 channels now too. Cruise mode for multi-rotors has been added, which is something that I believe was asked for quite a lot. As I say, I still haven't actually got an INAV multi-rotor yet but um, I'm building a seven inch that will be running INAV. So with cruise mode, it is similar to pause hold in you set the quad where you want it, you let go of a stick and it will hold that attitude and continue flying in that direction. Use the pitch stick to set the horizontal speed. And when you let go, it will maintain that course so the direction you're flying, your altitude and that speed. So yeah, nice addition. And there's a video showing it in action. The NMEA protocol has been removed from INAV. So if you've got an old GPS running that protocol, it's sorry, it's just not gonna work anymore. The reason being there were not many people using it and it's just basically taking up space and there are far better protocols that have replaced it. If you've got one of these old GPSs, try it on U blocks and see if it works. If not, unfortunately you will have to replace it with a U blocks GNSS module. Right, so there have been some GPS improvements in INAV 7. Basically, the update rate has been improved, so you can um, go up to a, quite a high level now with certain GPS units. And also extra uh, clusters have been added, so you can use Beidou, for example. With INAV 7.0, there is a caveat that you can't choose, I believe, uh, Beidou and Gloznas. You have to choose one or the other. That should be fixed in a later release. But yeah, so basically, you can get improved clusters um, and run it, run it faster. MSP VTX support has been added. So this is for HD0 people. I don't really know anything else that uses it at the moment, but in the future, I'm sure it's the way things probably will go. Um, so you can change the VTX power levels and channels via the OSD menu or um, ELRS backpack without needing to connect a smart audio wire. It will go over the standard UART. So you need to have MSP DisplayPort configured and working, and then it should all work. Right, the linear descent return to home has changed. This is one of those examples where it could affect you and you could get one of those red error codes in the CLI. Basically, there was a return to home mode called at least linear descent. And what that did was when you came home, if you're above the at least altitude, it would lower down to the RTH altitude on the way home. So basically saving energy because you're not flying straight, you're flying down, so you, you don't need to use so much power. This was a great feature, but it was only available on at least, and also you couldn't choose how far away you wanted the linear descent to start. You might have only wanted it close to home, or you could have wanted it for the whole flight. So what's happened is now the linear descent will work with any RTH mode. For that, it means the at least linear descent mode has gone. So if you used to use that, you should just switch to using at least, and then you can add the linear descent part. So the main change with this is it will now not go down to the RTH altitude because with some of the RTH modes that works differently. So we couldn't rely on that number it will actually come down to the RTH home altitude. If you want more detailed information, it is on the Return to Home wiki page, which is also linked. So let's take a look at those settings on the advanced tuning page. But if we go down to the RTH section, you can see here this RTH altitude mode 
was the one that would have been at least linear descent. It's now just set to at least. And you can see uh, we have an option here to turn linear descent on or off. So you can turn that on if you want to use linear descent. We have the distance that it starts descending and that's from the home point or the safe home point. So this will start descending at two kilometers and yeah, I believe it's up to 10. So let's try 20, it should, yeah. So it's up to 10 kilometers. And the other thing is you need to set an RTH home altitude. Now I believe if we set that to zero, it will go red. And that's because linear descent is on, so it needs this. If you want it the same as the RTH altitude or what you consider as a safe RTH altitude, you can set it to exactly the same number. I tend to go just above trees. So I think I had that set to 67 meters or something like that. So that should be above tree height. Just make sure it clears obstacles around you. And that will now descend down to 67 meters starting at two kilometers out. So that's how to use linear descent now and it will work with all of these as well. Next up is a feature that was asked for by a few people and that is to add pilot logos. Now there are two different types of pilot logo. There is a large logo that appears on the power on screen and the arming screen. This is only available on HD and there is also a small pilot logo that you can show anywhere on your OSD. And you will need to create your own fonts to do this, which is not as much work as people think. So if you're on analog, you can take one of the default analog fonts, um, just add your logo on, on the right characters, uh, render it and save it out. And the same goes with HD fonts. You can modify the, um, the file. So with walk snail, for example, I know it's a PNG file. You can just change the areas that you want your logo in and up upload that onto your goggles but there's more detailed information about it on the OSD page. So you can actually see examples here. There are default uh, logos already set up so you know where they are on the file. And um, there are just a few settings that you can change. There is arm screen display time. So if you, you, know, you put your pilot logo on there, do you want it to display longer? You can have the arm in screen display a little bit longer so you can see your logo. Also, the information might be useful to you. Um, there is a setting for INAV logo to pilot logo spacing, which if you leave it as default, it will display like this. The default value is a sort of reasonable gap for most HD systems. And uh, you can change this to whatever you want. It will actually um, depend on, depending on what system you're using, whether it's an odd or even number, it might increase or uh, decrease it slightly to make sure that the gap is more even but it will basically default to this sort of setup what you can do is set it to zero and that will put both logos next to each other and allow you to do something like this so this is sneaky fpv's logo and it's actually the two logos just right next to each other the last thing you need to set in cli is to enable the pilot logo it's just a simple on off switch if you have it on you'll get your logo if you have it off it will just be the inav logo for the smaller logo which is not actually shown in any examples on here if we go to the osd tab you just need to turn on pilot logo which is here and you just move it wherever you want this one works on analog or digital but you just choose where you want it save and that's it done so they were the main changes um, some other notable changes is auto level has been renamed auto level trim to try and get people out of the mindset that it levels the plane. It's actually a trimming tuning mode. It's not anything to keep the plane level. OSD MAH use precision has been renamed to OSD MAH precision. And that's the reason it is because it's used for multiple things now, just not, not just how much is used, it's used on other things. Uh, 24 channels for Jetty which yeah, I should have mentioned that it's not on F411 or F722. It's only on uh, bigger flight controllers. And virtual pitot is enabled by default. This has actually been taken away in 7.1. So just ignore that one. Uh, so other stuff, FreeSky D series telemetry has been removed, but that's so old, no one really uses it anyway. Um, and the output mode, that's basically the mixer stuff. So we've already covered that. 
there are a few new targets that have been added and then there are all these new or changed CLI items. And then we get this full list here of all the changes. So let me just take a brief look through here and see if there's anything that really stands out. So not really anything I'm going to go into, but the altitude control has been improved slightly. Most of this so far has been just document updates or um, sort of behind the scenes fixes to just make things better. Better bump detection for landing with multi rotors, that sort of thing. The programming framework documentation did have a fair bit of work. So if you want to check out that, if you're interested in the program programming framework, there's a lot more useful information in there now of how you can use it and quite a few examples too. There were some changes to the OSD throttle element. Basically you will see idle, stop or disarmed on the throttle, which is quite nice. Another thing that had been requested was an odometer in the OSD. So uh, I believe Painless360 was the guy who actually first asked for this in um, an issue and it's been implemented. So basically we've got this new odometer OSD element. To get this to work properly, you need to have stats enabled. So I believe in CLI it's set stats equals on to turn stats on. And then that will show the cumulative distance of all your flights, well, at least since enabling the stats. If you don't have stats on, this will just be the same as your current total flight distance. But there is that if you want to see that in your OSD. Yeah, so there's not really a lot more in there that really stands out. Um, so that was 7.0. So let's go straight to 7.1. So this has been released on, um, what is it, three days ago, April 1st. It wasn't actually a joke, it actually happened. So let's have a look at the big changes in here. If you fly a multi-rotor, you no longer need compass. You can just use a GPS and you can get navigation functions like position hold, uh, cruise, return to home, waypoint missions, you no longer need to use a compass. I will say that a compass is still recommended because it will be more precise, but you don't need to use it. One caveat with that is with INAF 7.1, when you set it up, you will need to have a compass enabled to first select the flight modes. It's a, a little oversight, but it will be fixed in the future release. So if you want to change flight modes, what you will need to do is go to the configuration page. And what you'll do is just set the magnetometer to fake, save, reboot. Then you can go to your modes page, set up the modes to whatever you want. Then once you've saved that, come back here and set the magnetometer back to none and you'll be all set. So um, that's one thing that's been added. Next thing, which is a really, really good um, big change is for fixed wing and that is the ability to auto land and again there is a separate document on this because it is quite in depth you need to make sure your navigation um, is working well but let's have a look and see if it's got some nice examples in the document so this is the documents for fixed wing auto landing and it's well worth going through this uh, in detail and seeing how it's set up. You can just use it with your current uh, setup, but if you want a bit more of a precise landing, you can add a, a LiDAR, which then it will add a flare to the end of the landing. So this is a graphic showing how it basically works. What you will do is set up a safe home, which is a special uh, landing safe home. Um, I believe it can actually be a, a waypoint as well and you can choose uh, approach paths. I can't remember off the top of my head how many you can set up. And what will happen is the aircraft will fly in and it will fly over the landing position and loiter. At that point, it works out the wind direction. So if you have multiple approach paths, it will work out the best approach path to take for the current wind uh, direction. So you don't need to worry about wind. At this point, we know that the wind is coming in this way, so it will do a downwind approach, then do a base leg, and then it will do the final approach. Then it will glide down, and finally, if you have a LiDAR, it will flare and land. So that's basically how it works, but there is a lot of stuff that you need to read, appreciate, and set up, and you'll probably need a little bit of tweaking to get this right. 
So it's well worth reading this document. It's, it's been well thought out, well written. It covers everything. Make sure you go through this. And I believe there's already improvements to this potentially coming in the next version. One of which is moving the loiter position to work out wind direction. I believe that's something that's been requested. But yeah, this is a much, much, much better system than the current just do a circle until you touch the ground approach. This is a proper approach pattern. And from all the testing, it's actually been very accurate, sort of within two to five meters of the landing spot. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a really good system. If you want to check this out, which I definitely do at some point, I haven't played with it yet, but um, it's something that I will be checking out and I'll make a video on it once I understand the system. But yeah, take a look at this. If you want to have a play, play, but yeah, awesome, awesome addition to INAV. Next thing that we have here is compass and barometer changes. So this is just listing a few changes that have happened. One of which is the compass is no longer needed for navigation, which we knew about anyway. So if you want to check this out in more detail, you can check it out at this link here. And the other one is the uh, tail sitter has now been added to the VTOL stuff. So again, you can check out the, the VTOL documents and stuff there. Other changes is the gyro filtering has been updated. You can now add your own custom messages in the programming framework as well to the OSD. So on the OSD page, we now have these custom OSD elements. So we can set up whether it's text, whether it's uh, an icon, it's a global variable or a global variable with different formatting. So let's choose text. We can actually type what text we want. And I'm guessing we're going to have to add something on this side. Ah, yeah, they're in global variables. So let's get rid of those because they confuse it. So we have custom element number one. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't change the size depending on what you got here, so which is a bit of a shame. Um, so it looks like you can have um, multiple things. So we could have flat. And then potentially we could have a global variable, which is a number, which we could set to whichever one and that could give us the percentage our flaps have changed. And then maybe we could have an icon. So that icon is going to be the number based on, on this. It's these icons here. So, um, we need a, a nicer way of finding out what these numbers are. If we go to the INAV configurator GitHub, there's the resources folder and the OSD folder and then character map. So we can find the icon we want to use. So let's say it's the house, that's number 10. So we would put 10 in there and then it'll be the house shows up. Yeah, it'd be nice if these updated to show what you've done here. But yeah, it looks like you could actually do um, quite a lot here. And also you can say, um, only show it when this logic condition is met. So yeah, it's very, very flexible and you can play with it and do whatever you want with it. So yeah, it's a nice, nice addition to the OSD. And the last thing is the artificial horizon will now not, not track properly the real horizon when the aircraft is inverted, which is something that not a lot of people noticed, but it did notice, <laughs> or I did notice. And once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. So this is what I'm talking about. So we can see the artificial horizon just about. It's here on screen. And before, if you're inver inverted, when you moved up and down, it would actually go the wrong way. But now it actually follows the horizon. So it works. And there's actually other firmwares where this is still a bug no one has uh, noticed or fixed it. So yeah, that, that was a, a nice thing. And there's also a new flight mode called angle hold, which basically when you fly at a certain angle, you can let go of the sticks and it will hold that exact attitude. That's, um, that could be useful for a few things, but yet yeah, that is 7.1. And again, I don't think there's gonna be too much in here. Oh. If you're a navigation person and quite like flying waypoint missions or using crews or anything like that, 
then this could be interesting for you. If you're um, a fixed wing pilot, um, you can now set a minimum ground speed. So in all the old versions of INAV, um, up until I can't remember when, there has always been a minimum ground speed, which was set at seven meters per second. So basically, if you're flying into wind, you've got a low throttle and the ground speed is less than seven meters per second, which is 25 kilometers an hour. So if you fly slower and you're in a flight mode that has auto throttle, so that could be cruise, it could be a waypoint mission, RTH, whatever, it will increase the throttle to get you to that 25 kilometers an hour. With this change, you can now actually set what you want that to be. So if you want to make sure that you get home quicker, you can increase it. If you've got a, an airplane that stalls at maybe five meters per second, you could maybe set it to six. So it's it takes a little bit longer, but maybe a bit more efficient coming back. But basically it gives you flexibility. This is a CLI only update because it is quite an advanced setting but you now have the ability to do that and you can see a few different tests that I have of it working. Um, there was a bug in auto level where it didn't save, but that has been fixed. Uh, the pin IO, pin IO has been added to the Speedy BF405 wing. So if you have the new uh, F405 wing mini, you can do the camera switching, but also if you have the older F405, you can buy a new PDB for it, which has got video switching or video power switching, I should say. So that should all work. I feel like I'm missing a change. Oh, so this is something that didn't pop up in that list. Um, the maximum number of LEDs that you can use has been increased. Uh, I believe it is now 128. Yep. So if you've got um, a lot of LEDs, you can use more. There we go, it was in 7.1. So this option allows you to have a delay if you fail safe. Um, before it does the emergency circle into the ground landing. There is a parameter in CLI, nav underscore RTH underscore FS underscore landing delay. And you can set this, I believe it's up to 30 minutes. But the idea is if you have a fail safe in flight and it's for a silly reason, like the batteries run out on your transmitter, instead of coming in and do the, doing the emergency land, which was the only way when this was written. We now have the really nice landing. Um, so I wouldn't use it with the really nice landing, but if you've only got the emergency landing, then this could be, uh, could be useful. Basically it will loiter above the home point while, or safe home until you, either the timer runs out or the battery gets too low or you take control back. So it's quite, quite a nice addition just gives you a little bit of chance to try and figure it out. Like I say, if it is just replacing a battery in your transmitter, it's something that you could possibly do. Maybe you power it from a power bank. It just gives you options. That was something that I didn't see it on the actual release notes, but it is definitely a merged change. So what I'll do is put a link in the video description uh, to these sec this section here, which is basically everything that has been merged into the version. So this is everything that has been merged into 7.0. And you can see there's like at least seven pages of it. Yeah, seven pages of changes that have gone into 7.0. If we check out 7.1, we have yeah another 65 changes. It might not seem like there's a huge amount, but there is quite a lot of stuff that has been changed. So th this is the same for Configurator. This is all the pull requests that have gone into Configurator for 7.0. There's 48 changes. I'll just have a quick look down here and see if there's anything that really uh, sticks, to, sticks out. So no, there's nothing really that we haven't already discussed uh, in there. So let's check 7.1. The board rate for MSP can now go down to 4,800. This is really gonna be useful for people using over the air serial links. Uh, sometimes they need to slow it down further than it used to be able to go to. So that's been added on the ports page. You can lower that down further. CLI autocomplete, we took a look at that. but. Um, yeah, most of this stuff we've already covered in the video. So I'm going to leave it there. There's a lot of new stuff in 7.0 and 7.1, which is just so good. It's well worth updating to this latest version. If you're watching this video in a month or so's time, there may be a 7.1.1 out or 7.1.2. These are just bug fix releases. So there won't be any major changes, just little things that have popped up 
will need to be fixed. So don't worry about that too much. Most of the features will be as they are here until we get to 8.0 at some point in the future. But anyway, I hope you guys found this video useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and click the subscribe and bell icon. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'll try and get back to you. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for sticking around, guys. I will still be sort of on and off for probably the next month or so just because of uh, other outside commitments. But I will be back in the future doing, you know, the videos that I used to do. Um, and yeah, I really want to do some tutorials on some of these iNav features like the Auto Land and the, the VTOL when I get the chance. So yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff to come up. I'm hoping for a very good year of flying. Just bring on the weather, please. <laughs> anyway, fly models like you stole them, guys. Have fun. I'll see you on the next one.